Hello, everyone. My name is Chris O'Connor, and I'm a learning program developer here at the Royal BC Museum uh, in Victoria, BC. Uh, we're going to show a couple slides, and then we're going to get into our tour. So I wanted to do like just a, a formal welcome first. So we're going to share share some slides right now. You are here for the Hibernating Animals of BC program here at the Royal BC Museum. The Royal BC Museum, as I said, it's it's in Victoria. And we're on the, the territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. Uh, we extend our appreciation for the opportunity to live and learn uh, on this territory. So the Royal BC Museum is located in Canada and the way, way farthest part of Canada uh, on Vancouver Island at the very bottom of Vancouver Island, as you can see there. Hello to, to people joining in. Um, as you see, that's the, the shape of, Vancouver, of British Columbia and Vancouver Island is a very large island just off of British Columbia. And the island right above Vancouver Island is Haida Gwaii. This is Vancouver Island and at the very bottom is Victoria, the Lekwungen speaking territories of the Songhees and Esquimalt nations. And then, where we are, that's what we look like. <laughs> that's what our building looks like. This is the Royal BC Museum. So the Royal BC Museum is a, oh, and I see someone joining from Souk as well. So you know you know this area well, but we'll have um, classes from all over uh, North America here. So, um, so this is uh, the outside of the museum. The Royal BC Museum is a natural and human history museum. Uh, it's a provincial museum that looks at all of British Columbia and tries to tell the deep, deep rich stories of the natural history and human histories, um, the vibrant stories of, of, of this province. Um, and within this building, you'll see to the right, there's this big tower um, to the right in the picture. That's the collection tower. That's where I am right now. And to the left is the galleries. Um, and then in the middle is the lobby. So we're gonna take away the, the, the slides right now and I'm actually gonna be, I said I was in the tower. So I'm gonna show you what it looks like from the other direction. So this is looking out into Victoria Harbor. So the, just to the left of us here is the legislature building. There's the Harbor here with lots of boats and then there's the Empress Hotel. So it's a really um, vibrant part of, of downtown Victoria, but you might notice that there's not many people out on the streets right now because Today, <laughs> we are in January and it's winter time and it's cold here in Victoria. Not as cold as other parts of, of British Columbia. It's not as snowy now, but it is winter. And what, we've, what so many of us find is during winter, things change a little bit. We like to stay a little bit more inside to stay warm. We try to conserve our energy. Maybe we wanna be under our covers, um, in the morning a little bit longer because we're trying to adapt to the cold weather. Um, and even our heartbeats with animals as well. So if in your classroom right now, if you just take your hand and you just tap on your, your chest and maybe go this, this amount of rhythm. So tap, 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 tap. This is us in the summer. 
and animals in the summer. And then when it starts to become the winter, often, especially with animals in BC, the heart rate, tap, 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 tap. It slows down, tap, tap. It slows down a lot. So you could stop tapping now. <laughs> it slows down a lot so that we can conserve our energy and be able to last throughout the, sometimes, especially in BC, some of the long, the long, long winter with lots of snow and very cold weather. So what we're gonna do today is we're gonna explore, we're gonna imagine the museum here and this collections part of the museum is kind of like a forest. And we're gonna travel through the forest to see some of the animals that are in, uh, in the museum. And all of these animal, animals are not alive. They lived good lives, long lives. Um, they did die and then they were, brought into the museum so that we could look at them and learn from them. Um, and we're gonna explore four animals that have different ways of uh, that they explore, that they, um, uh, ex that they uh, are in winter and survive in winter. So we're gonna look at four animals and those, uh, our tour guide through the collection is actually Anna Chin. And Anna, hi Anna. <laughs> and Anna is our collection manager of birds and mammals. Um, so she looks after this area, this forest of the collection. <laughs> and Anna's going to show us four different animals. And at the end, we're going to read. I'll, I'll read a book that also talks about even more animals uh, of the forest. So we're going to go. So Anna, so you're a collection manager. What does that mean? Uh, that means I look after all of the animals that we have here in the collection. I make sure that they're preserved properly and that they're available for people who want to learn from them, like researchers or classrooms. And why did you want to work in a museum? It's so fascinating. I love nature. I love animals. And this felt like a good way to do that. And when you were in elementary school, do you remember loving animals as well? Oh, and yeah, of course. Yeah, who doesn't love being outside and seeing squirrels run around? And yeah, uh -huh. of course. Did you have a favorite animal when you were a kid? When I was a kid? Oh, I, probably my dog, to be honest. Oh, your dog, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, we're talking about hibernation and dogs, your dog probably didn't hibernate. No, no. But uh, like some of one of the animals we'll see in the collection, my dog did grow a thicker coat, a thicker coat of fur during the winter to help him stay warm. Mm. When we use the word hibernation, and maybe everyone can say that word together. So hibernation. So let's say it together. Ready? One, two, three. Hibernation. I like that word. So what does hibernation mean, Anna? Uh, hibernation is just this period of time where certain kinds of animals will slow down their body activities. Um, and even it might seem like they're going to sleep. They're just their metabolism, so that's how much their body is working. It's just slowing right down so they can conserve energy. And this can happen for months and months at a time. Yeah. So for some one, some animals, it might be just a day. For another animal, it might be weeks. And another animal might be months. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yeah. Well, if it's for a day, usually we don't call that hibernation. Mm -hmm. It used to, usually has to happen for a long period of time. For okay. Us to call it hibernation. Great. So let's go explore the, the forest of yeah. the museum. Come on. <laughs> So this is the mammal collection space. And the first animals that I have here for you to look at are shrews. And this is a little shrew called the masked shrew. And they look a little bit like mice, but they're actually more closely related to moles. And shrews, they like eating insects um, like beetle larvae, they like eating fungus that's buried in the ground and sometimes even salamanders. And shrews are really interesting because they actually don't hibernate. Uh, they need to use other uh, strategies to survive the cold in the winter. Um, shrews, they often, they're so active, they need to eat sometimes three times their weight, their body weight every single day. Um, so in the winter, you know, they still have to survive and eat all that food. So they need to be able to, um, um, adapt to how cold it is outside. So what they'll do is they'll actually grow a longer and thicker coat 
during the winter, like our, like our dogs at home, um, that can help insulate them. It's like if we were to put on an extra sweater. Um, and another thing that they'll do is, in addition to growing a longer coat, is they'll actually get smaller during the winter. Um, I even read that some shrews, their brains will get smaller and their skulls will get smaller over the winter because a smaller animal actually requires less energy to survive. And then in the spring, they'll get bigger again um, and kind of resume the same activities that they, uh, they did the previous year. So it's not a hibernating animal, but they do need, because they don't hibernate, they need other ways to survive during the cold winter when they have to go look for food. And we had one question. Um, someone was wondering how hibernation is different in different continents. Oh, so in British Columbia, it's what, and Canada and North America, it's one thing, but say yeah. Africa, are oh, there yeah. animals that hibernate in Africa? <laughs> well, in interestingly enough, uh, so hibernation, that word comes from the word winter. So if any of you speak French, like Eva means winter. So hibernation, same kind of word. Somewhere like Africa, or in the tropics uh, where it's warmer, some animals actually estivate. So that means it's the same kind of process where their body um, slows down, um, their heartbeat slows down, but during the summer, because they need to escape the heat as opposed to escape mm. the cold. So the opposite of Yeah, exactly. Nice. So we saw shrews. If anyone has any questions as we're going along, please feel free to just put them in the chat. Um, and we're gonna go on to our next animal. Yeah. So we first, in our forest in the museum, we first saw a shrew, a little tiny cute shrew. And now we're looking at? Now we're looking at red squirrels. So red squirrels, um, they live all over BC from here on Vancouver Island, all the way out to the Rockies and up north to the Yukon. Um, and they live in forests and build their nests in holes and trees. And what they have to do during the winter, um, they, they are also not hibernators, but they do reduce their activities in the, in the winter. Um, what they do to survive is that they'll build all throughout the fall caches of food. So they'll stockpile big piles of food, including uh, pine cone seeds um, uh, in places that are really easy to get to from their nests and their trees. And then over the course of the winter, they'll only go out maybe once a day when it's warmest out um, to retrieve food from their caches. Uh, so they're you know, usually really active in the summer. You can hear them chittering at you from the trees, um, but in the winter, they, they're much less active. Um, they'll even make little tunnels underneath the snow to access their caches um, if it's really snowy out and difficult to move around above the snow. Mm. So the, so the shrew and the squirrels don't hibernate, mm -hmm. but they prepare for the winter. Yeah, exactly. And their behavior really changes mm -hmm. uh, during the winter. Yeah, yeah, and changes all throughout the seasons, depending on what kind of food is available to them and what the season is like. And these are particularly red squirrels, yeah. but there are different kinds of squirrels oh, yeah. in British Columbia. Yeah, um, we have the red squirrel, we have Douglas squirrel, which is more coastal around Vancouver. Um, there's the Eastern gray squirrel, which is actually not native to BC, but you'll see them in cities all around. And then fox squirrel, which is um, more in the interior. One thing I'm noticing right now, and I don't know in your classroom if you're noticing this as well, is the whiskers mm -hmm. are so long in these with these gray squirrels. I mean, with these red squirrels. Yeah. Can you say why, why that might be? Yeah, they use their whiskers to sense. So it's kind of, if, if you ever see your cats and dogs at home, they also have big long whiskers, um, but they, they'll use their whiskers as um, sensory organs. They have lots of nerves in their face that can, as, as they run past uh, um, trees or branches, you know, the, uh, if they, they can feel vibrations from their, their whiskers and uh, gather information in that way. And Karina, uh, one of the educators watching mm -hmm. with, with her learners, uh, is asking about the eyes. Okay, yeah. So as Chris said, all of these animals in the collection here are dead. And so to preserve them, we had to replace anything in their bodies that might rot. 
So that's like their muscles and their eyes. We need to replace them with cotton. So the white in their eyes is cotton. And that's so that they preserve uh, for as long as possible so that mm -hmm. we can use them as long as possible to learn from. Um, and Natalie from Victoria is wondering how many animals hibernate in Canada? Oh, that's a and good question. And maybe maybe as we're going to the next two animals that yeah. actually do hibernate, uh, maybe you can answer that question. Yeah, that's a really good question. I don't actually know the number, but in Canada, um, we have bears, which we'll see in a second, that hibernate. Um, a lot of marmots hibernate, and there are many species of marmot. Um, ground squirrels hibernate, lots of different species of ground squirrel. So a lot of rodents, um, bats hibernate, um, certain species of that at least. So lots of different kinds of animals that aren't very closely related to one another have found the same strategy to uh, survive the winter. And we had a comment that said, are we gonna talk about bears? Yes, we are. <laughs> what a segue. Yes, great, great intuition. So here we, I have a bra or black bear. Um, so this is the skull of an adult black bear. And I've got some fur over here as well. And so bears are what we, you know, think of first when we think of hibernation. Um, and bears, just like um, our squirrels, really have to prepare for the winter because as we were talking about earlier, hibernation is this long, months long time where um, these animals are not going out and uh, feeding like normal. Um, so what they'll do is over the course of the fall is that they'll eat as much as they can. They spend almost all their time looking for food and storing fat in their bodies uh, so that during the winter when they retreat to their dens, when it's cold enough and when the days get short enough, um, they go back to their dens and they just lie down and stay very still. It's not that technically sleep, but it looks a lot like sleep. Um, and they won't eat or drink or even pee for sometimes up to eight months, depending on where they live. So bears are, yeah, very interesting. Um, the, they're, not, they're not super deep hibernators. Um, some squirrels and uh, squirrel relatives, or I suppose ground squirrels and marmots, um, they'll go into really deep hibernation, but bears, their, their body temperature will drop about five degrees. Um, and they'll, they'll just stay, uh, you know, resting for a long period of time. Mm. And Anna, how do they know when to wake up? Well, once it gets warm enough, they'll, they, they can sense it. And um, I think, I, I believe it's temperature that drives their uh, uh, wake up from hibernation mm. largely. So bear, in British Columbia, bears that are further south, that are war is the warmer climates would would wake up sooner than yeah. bears oh, in absolutely. the north. Yeah, in southern Vancouver Island, bears won't hibernate. Oh yeah, yeah. But up north or um, at higher elevations on mountains, mm -hmm. um, bears will hibernate for a really long period of time. Yeah, so they have to really work even harder to store enough fat in their body uh, to survive the winter. Um, so we have a question: Does do de do deers hibernate? No, no, deers don't hibernate. Well, some, some kinds of deer, uh, depending on um, what species, will migrate. So that's a different strategy for um, escaping the winter. They'll, they'll leave where they usually live in the summer and they'll um, move somewhere that's warmer over the winter where there's more food available. Um, but other deer, you know, they'll grow thicker coats and they'll, um, you know, really prepare putting it like having a lot of fat in their bodies so that they can insulate themselves better. Um, their blood vessels are, uh, you know, organized in their body so that they can conserve heat um, more easily. Mm. And as uh, someone asked, though, we wouldn't want to do this, but if, if we came across a bear that was hibernating, oh. could we wake them up? Would we wake them up? It's possible that we could wake them up. Yeah, as I said, they aren't super deep hibernators. Um, so if we, if they're disturbed, uh, apparently bears can actually tell if someone comes up to their, close to their dens. Um, they could just sense it? They can sense it, yeah. Oh, wow. their, their heart rate goes up ah. um, and they might, they might 
you know, start rousing themselves. Uh, yeah. Um, we were also asked whether goats and moose <laughs> hibernate. Nope, definitely <laughs> no. It's similar to deer. So even, yeah, so similar to deer. Um, and elephants as well. Elephants, no, but <laughs> elephants do migrate. They'll, they, they do move long distances to find the right foods. But you were mentioning marmots. Yes. So as we end our trip through the forest of the collections here at the museum, uh, we're coming to our fourth animal. Yeah. So this is Vancouver Island marmot. Um, it's a, an animal that is uh, what we say endemic to BC. So it can only be found in BC, nowhere else. And specifically on Vancouver Island where Chris and I are today, um, they live on, uh, on mountains. So they really have to prepare for winter um, because they're you know, so snowy and cold up on the mountaintops. Um, and what they'll do is that they usually live with their families. They live in colonies. Um, they're all related to one another. And they'll um, go into their burrows um, probably around late September. Uh, and these burrows are sometimes a meter deep underground. And they'll uh, retreat there with their families and they'll go into really deep hibernation. So their body temperatures will drop sometimes 30 degrees Celsius, um, uh, close to uh, the temperature of the air underground. Mm -hmm. And they'll, they'll, that's to conserve energy so that they don't have, their bodies don't have to work as hard to keep them alive over the course of the winter. And then around May, they'll wake up again and go out and you'll be able to see them in the parks and on mountains. And being together, does that help? Like similar to the shrews, being all together, does that help with the... <laughs> yeah, well, shrews actually usually live by themselves. Oh, okay. Yeah, they, they don't live, uh, they aren't in a colony like, um, like marmots are. Yeah, it's a survival strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, when they aren't hibernating, living all together helps them um, keep track of predators so uh, they can let each other know um, by calling to one another mm. uh, if there's, they're in danger. Um, but yeah, when they're all together, they presumably could keep each other warmer um, if they're hibernating all in the same burrow. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions about different animals, whether they hibernate. Oh, oh gosh, I'll try to answer. <laughs> no guarantees that I know the answer. <laughs> so um, for example, worms or foxes oh. and also water animals. Yeah. Are there any water animals that hibernate? Yeah, yeah. Um, worms, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what worms do in the winter. Um, I, I would expect that they would slow down their body activities um, over the winter time. I don't know, I wouldn't necessarily call it hibernation. I, mm. It probably depends on the species of worm too. Mm -hmm. um, foxes, foxes don't hibernate. Um, at least I don't think they do. Uh, you see foxes, they'll, some of them will change the color of their coat over okay. the winter so that they can camouflage better in the snow. Um, so they can sneak up on there. Yeah. Their Actually, in the book we're going to read in a few minutes, um, that we'll see the active fox. Yeah. So. Okay. Great. Um, and then underwater animals, yes. Uh, some frogs and uh, turtles will hibernate. Um, turtles are interesting. They'll they'll sometimes bury themselves underneath like a pond floor, and they'll be able to um, stay there and kind of this this uh, like resting state because um, they're, they're able to turn their, their bones into uh, chemicals in their body to prevent them from getting too acidic. Like usually if you're breathing underwater, if you're, if you're staying underwater and you can't breathe, um, your body's producing all these acids. And so they're uh -huh. able to turn their bones into. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one, one more animal, uh, birds, and because you're the collection okay. manager of birds, birds. And, and mammals. Yeah, yeah, do birds hibernate? Uh, I, they don't typically hibernate. What they might do is they might go into what we call torpor, um, which is more of a short-term reduction of, uh, of body activity. So over the nighttime, if the bird is active during the day, um, they'll really reduce their heart rate, re like, you know, go into this kind of deep state of, um, of rest uh, so that they can conserve as much energy as possible um, mm. to prevent uh, themselves from freezing. 
And that's really the, what I what I get from all of these animals. The, there's different strategies, mm -hmm. yeah, and exactly. depending on um, whether they have fur or where they live yeah. in terms of climate, there's just different strategies to deal with either cold, really cold weather, or really hot weather. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whether it's like escaping by migrating, or you know, reducing your body activity or increasing your body activity like the <laughs> So um, we did get a question saying, do humans hibernate when they <laughs> sleep? <laughs> I wouldn't call that hibernating. Um, just more like torpor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and then the last question just for this section is um, from Gabrielle, I believe. Uh, what, what is, how do we get the animals that we have in this collection forest? Mm, it depends on the, the animal. Nowadays, we get our animals from the public, like you folks. Um, people will, you know, birds will hit windows or um, animals will get hit by cars. And so the public will sometimes bring us animals to um, donate to the collection. Mm. Um, we also get animals from like the Ministry of Environment. They sometimes do sampling and surveys and we'll find dead animals. Um, and that's how, yeah. That's how yeah. Today. And something like the Vancouver Island Island Marmot, where there's not that many mm -hmm. uh, left, yeah. then it's a very special thing to have it in the collection. Yeah. But obviously, would no one would go out and and kill or hurt yeah, intentionally. Yeah, Vancouver, Vancouver Island Marmot's actually interesting because there are all of these programs to monitor them. Um, the people who are monitoring them know exactly where each individual is at every at all times mm. so um once uh marmot dies they're able to go and collect their body um and donate them to the museum so that we can mm. learn more about the marmots mm -hmm. from um, the specimens great and how uh this is for real the last question how many uh birds and mammals are there at the museum at the museum there are uh, i'm not actually entirely sure <laughs> but um, I believe there are about 16,000 mammals and around 32,000 birds. Mm. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah our oldest specimen uh, dates back to the 1800s. So there the 1800s. Some, yeah, some of them are really old. Oh, yeah. And then some just recently yeah. uh, acquired. Yeah. So, um, so we're going to we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna turn the, well, actually I won't turn the camera around, but I'll, I'll give Anna the camera. <laughs> so what we're gonna do now is we're gonna read uh, a book that I love, that it's about um, what happens in the winter. And this could be in BC and it's called Over and Under the Snow. Just to give us a sense of even more, some of the animals we'll see are ones that now we know a little bit about and some are, we are new to us right now. So over the snow I glide into the woods, frosted fresh and white. Over the snow, a flash of fur, a red squirrel disappears down a crack. Where did he go? Under the snow, dad says. You see the little tail. So we saw a red squirrel mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's the tail of the red squirrel. So the whiskers, those long whiskers are deep under the snow there. Under the snow is a whole secret kingdom where the smallest forest animals stay, stay safe and warm. You're skiing over them right now. So there's the red squirrel. And it looks more red than the squirrels that are in our collections forest, mm -hmm. just because the, the color changes some once they're in the museum. Over the snow, I glide pa past beech trees. So these are the beech trees. Um, rattling leftover leaves and strong silent pines that stretch to the sky. On a high branch, a great horned owl peeps watch. Under the snow, a tiny shrew dodges columns of ice. It follows a cool tunnel along the moss out of sight. So we're looking at the shrews and those long noses um, that helps, helps them get around, especially under the, under the snow. Look, dad says, tracks. Tracks always tell a story. Over the snow, a deer has crossed our path. Deep hoofs. So we were asking whether deers hibernate and they don't because they're, they're moving and they're going across the snow there. 
Deep hoof prints punch through the crust up the hill under a tree. An oval of melted snow tells the story of a good night's sleep. Under the snow, deer mice doze. They huddle up, cuddle up against the cold in a nest of feathers and fur. And again, all of them together. Over the snow, I climb, digging in my edges so I don't slide back going up the hill. Under the snow, voles scratch through slippery tunnels, searching for morsels from summer feasts that collecting and then, and then eating. Over the snow, I swoosh down, down, faster, faster, down, faster, faster, whoops. Under the snow, a snowshoe hare watches from a shelter of spruce. Almost invisible, she smooths her fur, fur a coat of winter white. So she even like camouflages a bit in the snow there. To see their, her little pink ears. Over the snow, I glide past reeds where tadpoles play tag in springtime. Under the snow, fat bullfrogs snooze. They dream of sun warm days back when they had tails. And just like Anna was talking about the, um, the frogs underneath the, underneath the ground or the mud. Over the snow, I stand and stare little mountains in the marsh. Under the snow, beavers gnaw at aspen bark, settled in for supper. Can you hear my tummy rumbling too? Over the snow, stop a sound. We stand like statues carved in ice, like a till a bushy tailed fox steps from a thicket, tips his ear to the ground, listens, listens, listens still. So here's that fox that's not hibernating and looking for food and it whoosh, leaps out onto the snow after invisible dinner. So that fox is listening underneath the snow. His paws scratch away to find the mouse he heard scritch, scritch, scratching along the underneath, under the snow. Hopefully that mouse <laughs> maybe got her way. Over the snow I glide, a full moon lights my path to supper. Under the snow, a chipmunk waits for a meal. Bedroom, kitchen, hallway, uh, his house uh, is under my feet. Over the snow, I climb one last hill. Bonfire smoke rises, warm hands, hot cocoa, hot dogs, sizzling on pointed sticks. Under the snow, a black bear snores, still full of October blueberries and trout. So there's that bear that we were just looking at. Um, and we are not going to go near it to wake it up. <laughs> we'll let it, we'll let it uh, stay hibernating there. Over the snow, the fire crackles and sparks shoot up the, to the stars. I lick sticky marshmallow from my lips and lean back with heavy eyes. Shadows dance in the flames. Under a snow, a queen bumblebee drowses away. December, all alone. She, she'll rule a colony, a new colony in the spring. Over the snow, I glide home on tired legs. Clouds whisper down feathery soft flakes. And under the covers, I snuggle deep and drift into dreams of cuddling deer mice and slumbering frogs, hungry beavers and tunneling voles, drowsy bears and busy squirrels, and the secret kingdom under the snow. And that's the end. Over and under the snow. <laughs> So thanks for listening to our story time. Um, and uh, I wasn't able to see any of the questions. Oh, who's the author of the book? So the author of the book is Kate Messner with art by Christopher Silas Neal. Oh, and um, yeah, so I'm just looking at some of the questions and uh, so Karina was asking how many other classes are here today. And Liz, you, on the back end, you can, you can uh, maybe jump in and say, oh, about 25. We have 25 classes from as, maybe as far away as North Carolina. I saw a class from North Carolina, from Chicago. Actually, Anna used to, to work in Chicago, right? Yeah, that's true. And where did you work? I worked at the Peggy Note of Art Nature Museum. Ah, yeah. so. <laughs> yeah, if anyone's visited. So Lacey says hello from Chicago. Hi. <laughs> And then we have classes from as cl close to, as from Victoria and Souk. Um, so thank you. So uh, here, I'll, I'll turn the camera this way. 
um, but I will turn it around. Um, thank you so much for, for joining us. We're gonna put, um, we're gonna put, oh, and why do bees hibernate? I think what we'll need to do is have another program with our collection manager of entomology um, to look at some of the, the ways that we, uh, um, and the ways that insects uh, hibernate or, or, or uh, adjust and have strategies for the, for the winter. Um, so we're gonna put up a couple slides just at the very end here. Um, there is Anna, <laughs> is a picture. Um, so if you wanna ask any questions to Anna um, or, or us, and if, if you send it to Anna and it's not related to birds and mammals, um, she can send that along to our colleagues here at the Royal BC Museum that could answer the, your question. So feel free to contact uh, Anna, there's her email there. Um, and then we also, um, I'm part of the learning department and we do learning, we do digital field trips uh, uh, as part of our, of our learning department, many different kinds of digital field trips of all different parts of the museum, both in the galleries and in our digital learning studio. Um, and so that's our, our email there and our website. Um, and then uh, Liz had put a couple of links to some of our learning portal pathways. The learning portal is a really great um, platform to learn so many different things about British Columbia, both the animals and, and humans of British Columbia. Um, so there's so many different things to explore there at the learning portal, the Royal Beast Museum learning portal. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're so happy that you were able to join us today um, and we look forward to the next time. Um, but stay warm under your cover or under your snow. If, you, if any animals from BC are joining us and they're underneath this, if you're underneath the snow or in your den right now, um, uh, I hope you have a, a good rest and we'll see you in the spring. All right, thank you so much, everyone. Bye.